I selected this case because it's quite a complete case. It's been a long follow-up on the case and it's been progressing over the time and there's a lot of, of things to think about it and not lots of decisions that in a 10, 15, 20 minutes presentation is going to be very difficult to, to summarize and, and to justify perfectly exactly why did I choose every, everything. Um, he, here we have Floyd. Floyd was a four years old German Shepherd neutered male that presented to us because he was referred because he had tachycardia that didn't respond to lidocaine. We, we're going to be seeing why he was not responding to the lidocaine. Um, he had a, an history over one month of progressive exercise intolerance and then developed tachypnea. And, but otherwise was a, a perfectly healthy dog before. On physical examination, he was 36.4 kilos. He was tachypneic, more than 44 breaths per minute. He had mild abdominal distension with positive fluid thrill. He had positive hepatojugular reflux. He had a very regularly regular heart rate, heart rhythm, sorry, with a rate of more than 240. He had a marked pulse deficits, and he had a variable two to three uh, out of six left apical systolic murmur. Our initial diagnostic workup, we took blood. We always like to check the kidneys, etc., and that was normal. We measure, in our practice, we normally measure the cardiac troponins because it gives us an idea, not all, also only on, on the cell damage, actual cell damage, but also give us information, pronostic information. So this dog had 1.18 nanograms per milliliter, which is quite a high level, and that made us think that the prognostic was not going to be very good to start with, but and the blood pressure was still normal. On the ECG, we, we confirmed atrial fibrillation. It was fast, irregular, no P waves, more than 200 beats per minute. On the X-rays, that those X-rays are taken after after stabilizing the dog, and you can still see pulmonary veins were dilated, and there was a still some interstitial uh, pattern, and and the, and there was severe cardiomegaly. On the scan, we could see that the heart was dilated, both ventricle and atria, with a large end systolic volume and end diastolic volume. The mitral valve was quite, quite thick and knobbly, and there was a large amount of mitral regurgitation in both mitral and tricuspid valves. We have a large amount of regurgitation. So our final diagnosis was my myxomatous degenerative valvular disease with secondary, secondary myocardial failure, atrial fibrillation, and congestive heart failure. That is quite an interesting case because of the diagnosis. We normally tend to associate large breeds DCM, small breeds mitral valve disease, but we know that some large breed dogs, they can have mitral valve disease as well, and that was a, a, a nice example to show in, to our students and to discuss how you don't have to focus on, on what is evident and, and try to work up the case properly. So it was a, a nice example. Of, so the, the treatment strategy is we normally like to go for what is adequate for each case. So we always start with, when, when I was a student, we used to say that congestive heart failure was a two drugs treatment with furosemide and an ACE inhibitor. Then we introduced pimovendan and nowadays it seems that without the spinolactone, the treatment is not complete. So now we tend to say to the students, congestive heart failure now is a four drug treatment plus any other things that the, the, the case might require. We hospitalized the dog over the weekend. He came on a Friday night like they do and we give them furosemide IV two to four hour, every two to four hours until the, heart, the respiratory rate was under control. Then we added as well weight control medication, so digoxin and diltiazem. And then we discharged him, I think it was on a Wednesday, with furosemide, pimovendam, and azepril, spinolactone, digoxin and diltiazem. This case, as I said, it was, we, we've been following up this case until recently when he was put to sleep. So he presented on June 2009, so it's been like two years of following up the case. So as, as you all know, all, all, all who's, every person who's dealt with a congestive heart failure case knows that they tend to slowly progress and you have to adequate your doses, etc. And then there is a point that you start thinking, well, my, my furosemide is not working anymore as you wish because probably there's some resistance, etc. So you need to start thinking in other strategies. So normally we say that in the, in the kidney, we have <coughs> different 
places where we can, the sodium is reabsorbed, so 60% is in the proximal tubule, another 30% is in the loop of Henle, and then 7% is, or around about 7% is in the distal convolute tubule, and the collecting duct is 3%. So using different diuretics, you can block sequentially the nephron in different places, and then <coughs> producing diuresis in a step manner. So spinolactone, as we all know, is not a very potent diuretic, but we use it for other reasons. We use it for its anti-remodeling effect and because <coughs> it's been shown that in people, but also now in, in veterinary medicine, it reduces cardiac morbidity and mortality. Other loop diuretics that we don't use in our clinical practice very often, so thorazomite is another loop diuretic that we don't use routinely, but sometimes in these refractory cases that there's no way that they are going to produce any more urine than they should, and they, they are still on congestive heart failure. In some cases, we have experience with thorazomite, and it's been working. It, it gives a, a, an interesting result, like improving the quality of life for a little bit longer. Obviously, they are refractory cases that they are going to probably pass away soon, but at least with thorazomite, we've got some nice experience. It's, got, <coughs> it's known to have a longer half-life, it's uh, known to have more potent diuretic effect, to have some anti-aldosterone effect. It's got better oral absorption. The only thing is that in, veter oh, sorry. <coughs> in veterinary medicine, we don't have any clinical trial yet. So our approach with it is still not very confident. I still don't know how to use it properly. And this dog ended up having these four diuretics. In, in the UK, um, the thiazides, they come in a presentation combined with am 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 amyloride. And we added the thorazomite. I'm sure that if you have experience with it, you might have done differently, but we, we were not, or oh, I was not brave enough to stop the thorazomite and continue with thorazomite. So I, I did, instead of increasing the thorazomite further, I, I did add it on top of it. Then for rate control, we no normally start with digoxin, and we know that if that's not enough, we have to add also the diltiazem. Controlling the rate is going to help you to control the congestive heart failure. With digoxin, we tend to be very, very conservative with very low doses of 0.003 mix per kilo twice a day, and we check the throw levels one week later, and we aim them to be lo much, much lower than the levels that the that the lab uses to tell us that it should be, because we know that at these levels here, <coughs> the parasympathetic effect is already already enough, so we are happy with that. We are not aiming for the or the ionotropic effect, but we are aiming more for the heart rate reduction. So another strategy that we used in this case was after load reduction. The, the dog was constantly in congestive heart failure, so it was very difficult to get rid of it. It, it also presented some pulmonary, mild pulmonary hypertension, which was reactive, which was uh, post-capillary, and we, we added amlodipine. The idea behind it is that by reducing the, the post the, the post charge or by, by vasodilating peripherally, you are gonna allow more stroke volume to go into the or more volume of blood going into the aorta, and therefore reducing the, uh, the mitral regurgitation. The problem with it is that, as we said this morning, it can activate further the rush system and it also can cause tachycardia, so it needs to be very closely monitored. Another thing that we did in this case was, was draining the abdomen a few times because the dog was not very comfortable with his right side of congestive heart failure. So the most interesting part of this case was the monitoring. Um, we tend to be like have a lot of communication with the owners with these chronic cases. We like to teach them how to check for respiratory rate at home. If, if they are very compliant, we, we also ask them to check the heart, the heart rate. We also ask them to go once a week to their own bed to check the body weight and see what's going on there, mainly on, on cases of right-sided congestive heart failure. Um, we measure the renal function quite often, mainly when, when we change the diuretic doses or we change the, the, our pharmacological approach. We also, to check the, the heart rate, we, we perform halter monitors because we believe that when they come at home, uh, when they come to the, our practice, um, the sympathetic drive is going to play a role in, on their heart rate, so we don't trust very much what is measured on the consultation. We prefer to measure it at home. With the radiographs, although nowadays we are 
we, I know that that will be a bit controversial, but we tend to do them less and less, and we tend to believe more in our echocardiography. Since we can measure the pulmonary hypertension, we have an idea. So since we can measure the tricuspid and the pulmonic insufficiency velocities, we have an idea of the right-sided pressures, and that gives us an idea of what is the progression on, on, on this post-capillar type of uh, um, overload, if you want. And also, since these papers that have been published recently about how to measure feeling pressures, we start believing. I know that it's still early in, in their approach, but we, we start measuring quite a lot the feeling pressures with the echo, and that avoids sometimes to take radiographs. So that's an example how the, this owner was really very helpful and produced lots of graphs that she used to email me every week. So, so Floyd has been doing this, Floyd has been doing that. That was very nice of her. And that's more or less what we've been doing all over this, this first year of follow-up. You can see that here when, when we took, when we drained the abdomen, the, the, blood, the body weight went down quite nicely. That is normal if you take four liters of, of ascites. So in conclusions, um, we, this very chronic case is very important that the owner is, is committed to the case and helps you. So teaching them how to measure respiratory rate and heart rate makes them have a feeling of, of that they are participating with the case and that help us with their commitment as well. We like to believe that we are giving to the dogs quality of life instead of quantity of life because we believe that that's what the owner and ourselves prefer the dog to have, so better quality than, than a long time. And it's very important that we monitor them quite closely. So the more compliant and the more observant is the, the owner, probably the less times we have to ha see, see him and see the dog in our practice. And then a lot of, of it is knowing the pathophysiology and the therapeutics and et cetera to deal, to deal with the case. Well, thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed. Thank <clears throat> you.